This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. National Days At last, a new year is here, and mighty thankful are we who have gone through the last one relatively unscathed. Which was no small feat, mind you, as we here at the Word of the Week secret hideout inside Lincoln's left nostril can attest. Last year was a heck of a thing. All the usual political, social, and other guff aside, we had quite the year. One of the us who are we released a book full of words we wrote entirely by ourselves, all about how to play less worse games. The other of the us who are we released an actual tabletop RPG in collaboration with some friends, all about being artificial intelligences inside massive spaceships. Both of which are still available at our respective websites. Buy all our playsets and toys. Those two things alone would be enough to mark 2019 as a very good year indeed. But we also managed to turn out 49 more episodes of this very show and write articles on our websites and conduct successful Kickstarters and produce transcripts and attend a convention and meet cool people and interact with even more cool people through our Patreons and mail out postcards and appear on other podcasts as guests and really, that's a lot of very cool stuff to reflect back on. Especially when you add in the fun games we got to play and the people we played them with. It's a lot to remember and a lot to keep track of as it's happening. Fortunately, we have calendars to help us with that. They help us remember when holidays occur, what days of the week it is, when our birthdays are, any appointments we may have. You know how they work. We've talked about them before lots of times. The point that we are aggressively meandering towards, though, is that there are lots of dates on the calendar that don't have anything particularly notable attached to them. New Year's Day is January 1st, sure, but what about dates like January 8th, or April 12th, or even the 31st of February? They just sit there and do nothing except mark out a little slice of time we call a day. Nothing really remarkable about them at all except that they keep whizzing by as we pass through yet another year. An unstoppable passage of time as we make our way towards our inevitable doom. How boring. Good thing for us, then, that there are people in the world who attempt to help us fill up those days with special observances, occasions, and remembrances. You'll no doubt be familiar with these sorts of days. Pi Day, for instance, occurs every March 14th, Because, you see, in a particular arrangement of writing down all dates as numbers, writing down March as the third month, and therefore a number three, followed by the numerals one and four, yields three one four, or three point one four if we temporarily pretend that the designation for a division between numeric month and numeric day numbers is expressed as a dot and pronounced as point, and therefore yields the first three significant digits of the mathematical constant known as pi the relationship between the circle's circumference and its diameter. Except some folks, as we once purposely did for our own episode on the subject, will be happy to confuse the mathematical constant with the actual pastry known as pi, because any excuse for some pi is a good day indeed. By the way, you'll be happy to know that Pi Day was officially supported by the U.S. House of Representatives with a non-binding resolution in 2009. So there's something they've done. But then again, there's some argument to be made that really we should be celebrating Pi on Pi Approximation Day, which is, of course, the 22nd of July. Why? Well, again, because of the way no one seems to have actually agreed on how to write down dates in a universally understood and usably consistent way, if you write that date as the number 22 over the number 7 for the month of July, you know, like a fraction, you have the common approximation of pi and can therefore have more pi, P-I-E. And let's not even get started on June 28th and how much tau you may or may not be allowed to eat. It all gets a bit silly at that point, with observations geared to specific minutes of specific days that extend the number of digits represented in pi or tau or what have you. But most of the silliness can be blamed on physicist Larry Shaw. In 1988, he invented the first pi day while working at San Francisco's Exploratorium. He celebrated it by gathering everyone he could to march around one of the Exploratorium's circular spaces and then ate a variety of fruit pies. The whole thing kicked off at 1.59 p.m. on the day, 
and is still observed at the Exploratorium. Remember, any excuse for pie is a good day, and Shaw has come up with many, many excuses. More of a chemist than a mathematician? No problem. You can celebrate Mole Day on October 23rd between 6.02 a.m. and 6.02 p.m. in observance of Avogadro's number. Although we're pretty sure the maximum number of moles you should consume is round about zero, we're equally sure some people do anyway. Trivia time! Can you name an observance day, because we can't really call it a holiday, strictly speaking, which takes as its source material a film from the Walt Disney Company, was inspired by a sports injury, and is celebrated on an easily remembered date. That's right, International Talk Like a Pirate Day. What, you expected us to say something else? That's weird. Started by John Bauer and Mark Summers of Albany, Oregon, the day was initially a parody the two friends came up with after a racquetball game in which one of them suffered an injury and yelled out, "R" due to the pain. The game in question took place on November 6th, but because that is also D-Day in remembrance of the Normandy landings, the date was moved to the more easily remembered date for Summers of September 19th, his ex-wife's birthday. Observers of the day are meant to speak in traditional pirate speak throughout the course of their day. The real problem with Talk Like a Pirate Day, though, is that so few pirates talk like the pirates people talk like when they talk like pirates on Talk Like a Pirate Day. Almost all the linguistic affectations made on the day come from a single performance in a single film. Disney's 1950 adaptation of Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island. Robert Louis Stevenson was a Scottish-born novelist and travel writer. He traveled various parts of the world frequently during the late 19th century in spite of poor health due to respiratory problems he'd had since childhood. Ostensibly, much of this travel was to find a location and climate more beneficial to his health, but he soon developed a love of travel and wrote about it extensively, not just for the common press, but also in several journals and novels which were published in his own lifetime. So popular were these that Stevenson was to realize his fame and general acclaim while still alive, a feat few writers of the time could accomplish. Stevenson came from a line of lighthouse builders and engineers. It was in this capacity that Robert's father took him on trips to the coast to inspect the family's works in the form of lighthouses they had designed. From these outings, Robert collected some of his early inspirations in love of the sea. But Stevenson's life was often by turns chaotic and traumatic. His travels, especially in America, were often desperate affairs, ending due to his persistent illness with some kind stranger nursing him back to health from the brink of death due to exhaustion and stress. Still, nothing seemed to daunt his spirit, and he continued to incorporate his experiences, good and bad, into his novels. In 1881, writing under the pseudonym of Captain George North, he began publishing a serialized version of Treasure Island or The Mutiny of the Hispaniola in the children's magazine Young Folks. It was inspired by a treasure map he and his stepson had drawn during a rainy Scottish afternoon. Fresh off his initial travels to America and with the perils and adventures as well as the triumphs he'd had there still prominent in his mind, Stevenson made an enthusiastic start, writing the first 15 chapters in just as many days before his recurring illness cropped up again and forced him to stop and relocate to London before finishing the first draft. While writing the book, he was clear that it was to be an adventure for boys with no need of psychology or fine writing. In 1883, the serialized chapters were collected and printed as the novel Treasure Island. They met with instant acclaim and financial success from both critics and the general public. While it borrowed liberally from themes and ideas found in other works of both his own and earlier times, Stevenson's Treasure Island was influential in its own right on many works that came later. It basically kicked off the whole pirate genre as a subset of two earlier genres of nautical novels, the Navy Yarn, about brave and noble captains of brave and noble ships having brave and noble adventures in historical settings, much like Daniel Defoe's Captain Singleton character, and the Desert Island romance novels like Robinson Crusoe, also by Defoe because he knew a moneymaker when he saw one. So huge a success was Treasure Island that it bears almost all the blame for everything we think we know about pirates and the pirating life 
in the so-called golden age of piracy. None of it was based on anything historically accurate. Treasure maps marked with an X, parrots, peg legs, the nature of tropical islands, schooners and the way ships work, black spots and the pirate code, almost all of it comes straight from Treasure Island and has influenced pirate literature ever since, up to and including the whole Pirates of the Caribbean film series and amusement rides. Which is one reason why, in 1950, the Walt Disney Company released Treasure Island as their first completely live-action color film. Both the book and the movie tell the story of young Jim Hawkins, who goes off to seek his fortune, looking for buried treasure, runs afoul of a band of pirates, kills a few people, but in the end manages to live a bit happily ever after in spite of things. Things are significantly different from the book and the movie, though. Many of the things that happen on screen in the movie happened one way or another in the book, but if you've only ever seen the movie, you most definitely haven't really experienced the book. The endings are patently different in significant ways. Main characters' motivations are much less clear, and the numerous twists and turns of the tale, while similar, are different enough to make you wonder. Never fear, though. The film's production was so spectacular that, for 1950, it glued people to the seats and kept them watching. One of the biggest discrepancies, though, and the one we're most concerned with at the moment, occurs with the famous character Long John Silver. Or should we say infamous? Long John Silver is the main antagonist, a seemingly legendary sailor of unparalleled seamanship and valor. A man born on only one leg, having lost the other at sea, he uses a crutch to get about. But this should by no means be mistaken for weakness, for Silver is a man to be reckoned with. He starts aboard the ship as the cook, but it soon becomes evident he is much more than that as he organizes a mutiny and reveals himself as the pirate he is. He is deceitful and devoid of any gentler impulse, preferring to rely on his own craftiness to ensure his success at the cost of anyone and everyone else involved with him. A heart blacker than his is seldom seen. In only one way does he demonstrate any redeeming quality. He seems to take young Jim Hawkins under his wing as a sort of fatherly figure. Whether this is genuine or merely the means to an end in another of Silver's plots to reclaim the treasure of Captain Flint is never fully explored. But it does serve to keep Jim guessing and sees him land on Silver's side at crucial moments. As written, Long John Silver is a reasonably articulate man. He's easily understandable if heavily influenced by nautical terms and manners of speech. For the most part, it's Silver's parrot that has all the real piratey lines in the novel, screaming out things like pieces of eight when Jim eventually infiltrates Silver's camp, for example. Not so the Long John Silver of Disney fame. The film Silver is played by Robert Newton, at the time a popular British actor of the stage and screen, especially among young male audiences. Such was his fame and popularity that other performers were said to have modeled their lives on his, which Considering he ended up dead at the age of 50 after a heart attack contributed to, in part, by his rampant alcoholism, may not be the best model one could follow. Newton was born in the West Country of England in Dorset and grew up in Cornwall. Now, if you aren't English, that information may not mean much to you right off the bat. That's okay, because the important bit of that is that there is a thing called the West Country accent. It is English in nature, but harkens back to an older time and tradition which has ignored much of the modern softening of the English language and left in many of the Anglo-Saxon and Old English usages and pronunciation. In fact, so much older and closer to its roots is the West Country dialect that many modern English speakers have stigmatized it as the language of the poor, uneducated, and lower class, helped in no small part by the media producers of the world. Nothing could be further from the truth. There's a lot to go into, and it is well beyond the scope of this episode, but to the modern inexperienced ear, the West Country accent, particularly with the Cornish influence, sounds confusing and perhaps even a bit unrefined. However, it's the kind of confusing and unrefined that you recognize as being something you should understand, but don't. You've heard it, though, or something like it. We can guarantee it. 
Because what Robert Newton did when he played Long John Silver, not just in the Disney film, but twice more in Australia productions as well as a turn playing Blackbeard, was to stop using the nice, proper English accent he had cultivated so he could do things like be a star of stage and screen and be understood by the masses, and instead fully leaned into his normal, homegrown West Country accent. Every line you hear Long John Silver say in the film is filtered through that accent and that manner of speech. Every ar avast ye and ahoy me hearties is the West Country accent brought to the screen. And so compelling is Newton's performance as Long John Silver that it is what we think, pop culturally, all pirates speak like. By now, of course, nearly every pirate on the big or small screen has engaged in some form of imitation, to a greater or lesser extent, of that single and singular performance. And therefore, it's how we all talk during Talk Like a Pirate Day, even though pirates came from everywhere and had all sorts of accents and languages. We all do it automatically. And so, it's only fair that Bauer and Summers, the creators, named Robert Newton the patron saint of international talk like a pirate day. But pie and pirates, ha <laughs> ha, are not the only things that have special days set aside for them as less than officially recognized observances. For the United States, there are national days for almost every conceivable good, service, resource, and more. National Coffee Day is September 29th. Unless you want to have your coffee with a cop, in which case you should head down to the coffee shop on the first Wednesday in October. However, National Donut Day is on the first Friday in June, which seems like a terrible oversight on somebody's part. National Disc Golf, Jamaican Patty, and Mustard Day, as well as Mead Day, are all on the first Saturday in August, which must make for a lovely combo. But National Fitness, Scrapbook, Homebrew, Bombshells Day, and Start Seeing Monarchs Day are all on Free Comic Book Day, also known as the first Saturday in May, and we expect that will cause more than just a little bit of trouble trying to celebrate them all at once. Which is to say nothing of national weeks like National Pooper Scooper Week during the first week of April, and national months such as January's own National Hot Tea Month, clearly superior to a mere National Coffee Day. The list of international days of observance are even worse, because literally everyone has to get their oar in the water at that point. So the big question is really, who's responsible for this mess of mishmashed, madcap memorials, mementos, and mere mentions? And unfortunately, the answer is nearly everyone. We'll start with the big stuff. The President and the Congress of the United States are responsible for the declaration of 11 federal holidays. In 1870, the Congress passed the first federal holiday law, and initially it only applied to the 5,300 or so federal employees working in and around Washington, D.C., officially giving them the day off work from non-essential services, usually with pay, and paying those who did have to work those days a little extra. The June 28th Act provided that New Year's Day, Independence Day, Christmas Day, and any day appointed or recommended by the President of the United States as a day of public fasting or thanksgiving were to be holidays within the District of Columbia. And we talked about Thanksgiving just a few weeks ago, so you already know that story. In 1879, Congress added George Washington's birthday to be observed on February 22nd in an act intended to specifically create a bank holiday. Not until the Uniform Monday Holiday Act of 1968 would the date move to the third Monday in February. In 1888, Congress introduced Decoration Day, which became Memorial Day, and in 1968, moved from May 30th to the last Monday in May. Labor Day was introduced in 1894. By 1938, Armistice Day was already being celebrated as the end of World War I in 48 states as a day to recognize and celebrate mankind's blessing during peacetime. So it was easy enough for Congress to just go ahead and make it official and federal, and in 1954, they expanded it to recognize and commemorate the sacrifices of all veterans and changed the name to Memorial Day. The 1968 Monday Holiday Act attempted, unsuccessfully, to move it from its original date of November 11th to the fourth Monday in October. But since everyone hated it and the states maintained the old date in spite of the change, Congress put it back on November 11th and have since left it alone. 
1957, Inauguration Day became an official federal holiday in Washington, D.C., thanks to President Eisenhower, with special provisions made for occasions on which the date fell on a weekend. In 1968, Columbus Day was established by Congress as a federal day since 45 states were already observing it, and finally in 1983, Martin Luther King Jr. Day was signed into law by President Reagan after lengthy ongoing efforts and much debate in the legislature. But those are just the big ones. Presidential authority provides that the President of the United States can declare days of observance by presidential proclamation. To date, 61 individual annual days of observance have been set. These include everything from the fixing of the date of Thanksgiving to the National Day of Prayer to Mother's Day and Father's Day. There are also a further 20 special weeks and an incredible 55 months of observance or awareness officially set by presidential proclamation and another 50 or so set by Congress. And therein lies the trouble, sort of. Because once you start making things like National Ice Cream Month, July, and National Character Counts Week, third week of October, official, a lot of other people with particular interests start asking, hey, what about us? Where's National Nematode Month, or Plastic Comb Awareness Week, or National Leaning to the Left and Saying Pibble Day? Fortunately, someone spotted the opportunity and didn't mind the fame and fortune that comes with it. In January of 2013, Marlo Anderson of Mandan, North Dakota, a tech journalist and talk show host, started the National Day Calendar. He listed both in a physical calendar and on the associated website every national day of observance, remembrance, or what have you in a reasonably easy to access form. You can look things up by date, topic, or even just put in your birthday and see what turns up. And because journalists are kind of lazy but also working to a deadline, the website became very popular with the sorts of journalists and commentators who are looking to fill time and word count in as easy a manner as possible. It helps that National Day Calendar lists not only the days themselves, but also a tiny bit of nuggety research about how each day came into being. You know, easily quotable lines that you don't necessarily have to think about too much. And this is the source of the majority of National Day Ofs that we've come to know about. And as one of the features of the website, they mention their extensive reach and their ability to get special days front and center of the media. So you know, if you have a special person or a cause or just a wonderful product you want folks to know about, they'll be happy to help you register your day and get the word out. It's not official official. That requires an act of Congress. But hey, who cares if everyone is talking about it anyway? National Tempura Day, National Bobblehead Day, National Argyle Day, National Bubble Bath Day, National Joy Germ Day, National Winter Skin Relief Day, National English Toffee Day... We're pretty confident there is room for a national GM Word of the Week day somewhere in there. This has been GM Word of the Week. It's written and researched by the Angry GM and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash GM Word of the Week. You can find more at gmwordoftheweek.com and theangrygm.com. 